The United Church of God says of Christianity, Historically, the original apostolic church, which adhered closely to God's law, faded from view as a great false Christianity assumed prominence. Most of what goes by the name of Christianity today is saturated with teachings and practices originating in ancient pagan religion and philosophy. This is a major aspect of what the Bible calls mystery, Babylon the Great, Revelation 17, verse 5. In that statement, the UCG echoes the original teaching of the church they divided from in 1995, the Worldwide Church of God founded by Herbert W. Armstrong. The Worldwide Church of God taught many things considered quite unorthodox by the rest of Christendom, and likewise, they viewed the rest of Christianity as apostate. When in 1986 Armstrong died, the next generation of leadership began to repudiate much of his teachings. This would lead to churches that continued to teach what Armstrong taught breaking off. The United Church of God is the largest such group. Later in 2009, the Worldwide Church of God renamed to Grace Communion International. With little exception, the UCG teaches what the Worldwide Church of God originally taught under Herbert Armstrong. The official name of the church is United Church of God and International Association. On who God is, the UCG is not Trinitarian, but rather what some would call Binitarian. Of the Trinity, they say that it has inherent contradictions. Of their own view, they say scripture further reveals God as two distinct divine beings, God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son. Of Jesus, they say, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is the Word and who has eternally existed. We believe that he is the Messiah, the Christ, the divine Son of the living God, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born in human flesh of the Virgin Mary. We believe that it is by him that God created all things, and that without him was not anything made that was made. They also say, as Father and Son, the one God is thus the one God family. The distinction between these two beings existing together as God is implicit from the very beginning of Scripture, Genesis 1.1, where the Hebrew word Elohim is used. Elohim is the plural form of the Hebrew word for God, Eloah. As distinct beings, the Father and Son each have a glorious spirit body. These spirit bodies have form and shape, as Moses saw the form of the Lord. God as spirit is not visible to human beings unless supernaturally manifested. On the Holy Spirit, they say, We believe in the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God and of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the power of God and the Spirit of life eternal. The Holy Spirit of God is not identified as the third person in a trinity, but is presented in Scripture as the power of God, the mind of God, and the very essence and life force of God through which the Father begets human beings as his spiritual children. Further, the church teaches that humans can join this God family. They say, Human beings are also called Elohim or gods in Scripture in reference to the ultimate purpose for our creation. God is in the process of expanding the divine family beyond the Father and Son. Human beings have the wonderful potential to enter the God family and be transformed into the same kind of beings the Father and Christ now are. God said he would make man in his own image and likeness. The clear implication is that man was created according to the God kind, so to speak, with God intending to reproduce himself through human beings. Human beings, as physical flesh and blood creatures, have initially been formed on a much lower level than God. We will be spirit beings like Christ. Indeed, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Presently, the one God, that is, the one God family, consists of two divine beings, God the Father and Jesus Christ. But ultimately, God intends to expand this divine family into billions. Of baptism, the church says, We believe in the ordinance of water baptism by immersion after repentance. Through the laying on of hands with prayer, the believer receives the Holy Spirit and becomes a part of the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. The only biblical form of baptism is a complete immersion in water. Repentance precedes baptism, the latter being an outward sign of our commitment to leave our old ways behind and embark on a new life cleansed through Christ. Then, after repentance and baptism, God's Spirit is given to a person through the laying on of hands by a duly ordained servant of God. Baptism is for the forgiveness of sins and causes all past sins to be blotted out. There's no set age, but it must be by a person who can fully comprehend what is taking place. The UCG website says it is normally as someone enters young adult years. Does the church practice the Lord's Supper? Here's what they have to say about that. While Paul does not directly disallow the term Lord's Supper, neither does he endorse it. Rather, he emphasizes that the tradition he received involved only bread and wine, not a supper meal. There is no scriptural instruction to use the term Lord's Supper to refer to the Passover. So there is a yearly observance of Passover. The church says, 
All three elements, the foot washing, the unleavened bread, and the wine are to be part of the annual observance of the Passover. It should be observed only once a year after sunset at the beginning of the 14th day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar as established by the word of God. If a person can't observe the Passover on the 14th day, they can do it the month following. The bread and wine are viewed as symbols and representative of Jesus' body and blood. The bread is always unleavened and the wine is to be unfortified, 10 to 13% alcohol. The Passover is only for those baptized, so children do not participate. There is a 66-book canon of scripture of which they say, Scripture is inspired in thought and word, infallible in the original writings, the supreme and final authority of faith and life, and is the foundation of all truth. On creation, they state, Nearly 6,000 years ago, God prepared this world for human habitation during a single week, as explained in Genesis 1. In the several days prior to man's creation, God made different forms of life, each of which was to reproduce according to its kind. This principle rules out evolution as commonly understood, the idea that creatures evolve from one kind into another. God designed the genetic code to allow limited changes within kinds, but not from one kind to another. However, the UCG does not teach that the earth was created 6,000 years ago. Rather, they teach that the initial creation was followed by some catastrophic event, and Genesis 1-3 begins telling about the renewal of the earth from this condition. The length of time between creation and the renewal is unknown. The angels inhabited the original earth for hundreds, thousands, millions, or billions of years, along with plant and animal life such as dinosaurs, but the world was pre-Adamic, before the creation of the first man, Adam. The UCG denies original sin. For example, UCG preacher Sam Sweat in a video posted on the UCG website stated that original sin just can't be true. On salvation, they say, salvation itself is a free gift of God, not based on works, and God desires to give to every human being the gift of eternal life as a member of his family. Eternal life is not something a person can earn. However, God will not grant this precious gift to anyone who does not yield to him and his law. Repentance is required, of which they say that it is a change from sinning to ceasing from sin, from disobeying God's law to obeying it. And they also say that God reveals to us through the divinely inspired scriptures that salvation is not automatically granted to every human being. He will bestow this blessing on only those who have proven their willingness to obey him. Of conversion, it is said, Though conversion takes place at a definite time, it begins with a process, repentance, that culminates in an event, baptism, and the laying on of hands to receive God's Holy Spirit. The term of born again, following Armstrong's teaching, is believed to refer to an event that takes place at the resurrection. Spiritual conception or procreation can take place in this life through conversion, but not the new birth. The UCG rejects unconditional election, stating, Yet even God, who is all-powerful, does not create perfect character in human beings by simply willing that result. The development of righteous character requires a conscious decision by a being with free will to conduct his or her life based on knowledge of what is morally right and wrong, choosing what is right and rejecting what is wrong. A person can apostatize and become unsaved, as they state, God does not condemn the believer, Romans 8, 1, as long as he or she continues with God in the ongoing process of repenting and overcoming sin. Only if repentance permanently ceases is there no longer forgiveness. They do not teach entire sanctification. The UCG fundamental belief states about ministers, as part of their work, they have also been authorized to, in Jesus' name, cast out demons and lay hands on the sick with anointing oil and pray for healing. Yet, while God has established this authority and practice and often intervenes according to it, he may require further conditions such as faith, repentance, obedience, and persistence in prayer. A common practice for those sick and unable to attend a service but in need of healing is to have them be sent an anointed cloth. A letter, the church says, may be sent along with the cloth reads, In the book of Acts, it states, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them. Here we see that pieces of cloth from the Apostle Paul were used to extend the gift of healing beyond his physical presence. Following this example, I will make a special prayer to God on your behalf, anointing the enclosed cloth with a small amount of olive oil. Please go to a private place and ask God for his healing while you briefly place the cloth on your forehead. Remember that in his wisdom, God chooses how and when to answer our prayers according to what is ultimately best for us. Of speaking in tongues, the UCG says that what many call speaking in tongues today is nothing like what the Bible records, and that it means every member of the audience could hear his or her native tongue. 
They also warn against spiritual appearing phenomena, saying that demon spirits sometimes imitate spiritual gifts to confuse people. On end times or eschatology, the church teaches a future 1,000 year reign of Christ on the earth, the millennium, and that after the thousand years, the vast majority of people who have ever lived will be resurrected and either be converted and gain eternal life or reject salvation and receive eternal death. They say it will be an exciting time when billions of people from all periods of history will come back to life. People who were fully aware of God's truth and rejected it will be cast into the lake of fire. Prior to the millennium will be a time of great tribulation. They state, Satan will then be removed and bound throughout the millennial reign of the Messiah, but will be released for a short while at the end of the 1,000 years. After that, he will be permanently removed when he is cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. After this is the new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. The Sabbath will be observed by all of humanity during the millennium. Cecil Marinville on the church's Beyond Today website calls the doctrine of the rapture a popular but false doctrine. In the church's booklet, The Rapture Versus the Bible, they state, We will indeed be caught up into the air to be with Christ, but this will come at the end of the great tribulation and day of the Lord. The UCG teaches what Armstrong did about these seven churches of Revelation, that they also represent seven eras of time, the final and current one being the Philadelphia era. They teach that this era began in 1931 or 1934. Like most denominations connected to the Adventist movement, they teach unconsciousness and death, and that there is no conscious immortal soul that can leave the body. They say, unconscious of itself, apart from the body, this spirit returns to God at death, Ecclesiastes 12.7. In the future resurrection, God will place the spirits of those who have died into new bodies, returning them to conscious intelligence with their personalities and memories intact. The lake of fire, where all unbelievers ultimately go, is not a place of eternal conscious torment. They will be annihilated, ending their lives and existence quickly and forever. The church, following the teachings of Armstrong, teaches British Israelism. Here's how they describe this. Many Jews of the southern kingdom of Judah, though deported to Babylon, later returned to the land of Judea. However, the Israelites of the northern kingdom of Israel who were deported to Assyria did not return to resettle in their former homeland. They became what are now known as the Lost Ten Tribes of Israel. Over the course of time, these people migrated to northwestern Europe. The descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh have received the blessing of ascendance to national greatness. Ephraim has become the promised company of nations, Great Britain and the Commonwealth peoples of British ancestry, such as Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. And Manasseh has become a great nation, the United States of America. It is through these people that the prophecies of the Bible concerning Israel are being primarily fulfilled. However, the tribes of Israel today also exist in other nations of or emergent from northwestern Europe. The Jewish people today are descendants of the people of the ancient kingdom of Judah, meaning that while Jews are Israelites, not all Israelites are Jews. The birthright promises from God of national greatness, strength, and bountiful material blessings that were passed from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joseph have been given to Britain and the United States in great measure in the last 200 years. The church is spiritual Israel, and some prophetic references to Israel, Jerusalem, and Zion apply to the church. This is not a replacement theology claiming that all prophecies and promises to Israel are fulfilled in the church, for clearly there is still a role to play for the physical descendants of Israel. National promises and prophecies still apply to them. Rather, the church is a forerunner in the covenant relationship God promised to Israel. On marriage and sexuality, the UCG says, God made women and established marriage, a covenant partnership between a man and a woman and with God. The seventh commandment forbidding adultery in its spiritual intent prohibits any sexual relations outside of marriage as well as fantasizing about such relations. Thus, sexual immorality in general, including premarital sex and homosexual relations, is forbidden as detailed elsewhere in God's laws. The church teaches that Christians are to only marry other believers. They also say, Inasmuch as we do not find the early church expelling members for marrying outside the faith, neither will we. The church's doctrinal study paper on interracial marriage concludes, Scripture does not teach against interracial marriage. Scripture does teach against interreligious marriage because it led Israel away from God. While Herbert Armstrong was the leader of the Worldwide Church of God, that church had opposed interracial marriage, and this had been reformed under the presidency of Joseph Dukach Sr. before the UCG split off. The church's Beyond Today website says that marriage is to last a lifetime, but they recognize that some marriages will end in divorce. Sexual misconduct is a justified ground for divorce, and the innocent party can remarry. If an unbeliever departs, the believer may get remarried. Additionally, a person who divorced before salvation can be remarried. 
They say of human life, we are not to murder self or help someone else to commit suicide and we are not to commit abortion. Though there is not complete agreement between all UCG churches on music, they do teach that not all music is acceptable in worship. For example, the church's statement on music in the Bible says, if a musical style brings the worshiper back into the spirit and associations of the world, it is not fulfilling a godly purpose and is not appropriate for worship. The Apostle John instructed, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 As Christians, we must always be careful when selecting music not to cater to the world or the world's entertainment, but to select material that fits within the context of worshiping and praising God. On clothing, they say, we show our respect for God by dressing in an appropriately modest yet modern styles of clothing, without feeling compelled to wear the robes of ancient times. Some churches are more conservative than others. In many, people still dress their Sunday best. On wearing crosses or using them as a Christian symbol, the church's website says, While most people today connect the cross with Christianity rather than paganism, we must also ask if the cross is something to be worshipped or honored. While the apostles preached the cross, staros, as part of the history of Christ's ministry for our sakes, it was not something they idolized. It was a shameful instrument of death. In his crucifixion, Jesus took on himself our shameful sins. Having our sins forgiven is a wonderful blessing, but there is no need to glorify the instrument used. People who truly practice the Christianity of the Bible stand out as beacons of light in a spiritually darkened society because of the way they live. They have no need to wear external signs like a cross to identify themselves as Christian. At some times, Herbert W. Armstrong and the Worldwide Church of God had prohibited women wearing makeup. In an article on their website on the subject, the UCG says, the modest use of makeup by women is culturally acceptable in the Western world at this time and does not conflict with the teaching of the Bible. The church's Beyond Today website says of alcohol, Drinking alcoholic beverages is not in itself a sin. The Bible teaches that it's the misuse of alcohol that is a sin. Most people can learn to avoid the abuses so prevalent in society today and can properly use alcoholic beverages in moderation if they desire. In the UCG book, What Does the Bible Teach About Tithing?, it is explained that there is a first tithe of 10%, a second tithe to be used for festival observance, which is also 10%. They also say that biblically every third year should be given another tithe for the care of the poor. However, they state about this, the Council of Elders has resolved that where governments provide programs, the intent and purpose of which is to provide for the needs of those that the biblical third tithe was designed to assist, and that where such programs are funded by an annual rate of taxation greater than the biblical third tithe, members are not obligated to pay what amounts to an additional third tithe to the church. Tithing is a universal law, but the UCG does not enforce or regulate tithe paying. The UCG also states that the burden of the various forms of tax today is often oppressive and confiscatory, and following this that tithes should be calculated on income after taxes are deducted. On the Sabbath day, they state, we believe that the seventh day of the week is the Sabbath of the Lord our God. On this day, we are commanded to rest from our labors and worship God, following the teachings and example of Jesus, the apostles, and the New Testament church. The Sabbath is from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. This issue is taken quite seriously, which is partially reflected in the fact that the church has a 10-page administrative policy statement on the question of whether a person can eat out at a restaurant on the Sabbath. Here's their answer on that. The conclusion of the church is that eating out on the Sabbath does not violate the Sabbath command. Whether one eats out on the Sabbath or does not eat out is a personal choice, but it must not become a point of division within the church. The church rejects celebrating holidays not in scripture, such as Christmas and Easter, but does teach that Christians are commanded to observe seven annual festivals, which reveal God's plan of salvation. Passover is one of these, and the others are the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Eighth Day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread starts on the day after Passover and continues for seven days. During this time, UCG members remove leavening agents like yeast from their homes and don't eat leavened products. Church members fast on the Day of Atonement. On the Feast of Tabernacles, which lasts seven days, church members meet in regional gatherings and live in temporary dwellings. The eighth day, which the church says is given no formal name in scripture, is also a festival that UCG says that they don't have conclusive evidence as to its timing. They observe it the day following the Feast of Tabernacles, but admit that others believe it is rightly the last day of that feast. Because festivals are based off the Hebrew calendar, the UCG has had to address questions surrounding various theories on the calendar. On this issue, they have stated, 
the United Church of God has chosen to accept the Hebrew calendar as preserved by the Jews. We have embarked on a study of the calendar and are reviewing submitted papers. At this point in time, we have not seen enough evidence to cause us to reject the currently accepted Hebrew calendar. In another 10-page paper, they address challenges to this position from people who use Exodus 34.22 as an argument against the traditional Hebrew calendar. Similarly, the church has an entire position paper that deals with the disputed question on which day the Passover lamb was slain and when it should be observed today. The church's 10-page paper on the observance of new moons concludes, While the United Church of God is eager to observe all the institutions commanded by God, we do not have a biblical command to observe new moons. Of food laws, they say, We believe that those meats that are designated unclean by God in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 are not to be eaten. The church also teaches against eating fat and blood. The UCG has precise teaching on when Jesus died. They say that a major problem with the commonly accepted belief regarding the timing of the crucifixion and resurrection is that there are not three days and three nights between Good Friday afternoon and Easter Sunday morning. The weight of scriptural and historical evidence leads us to conclude that Jesus died on a Wednesday afternoon, that his body was hurriedly placed in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea shortly before sunset that same afternoon, the eve of an annual Sabbath, a holy rest day, the first day of unleavened bread, and that Jesus was resurrected by the Father near sunset on Saturday, the end of the weekly Sabbath, three days and three nights after being placed in the tomb, exactly as he had said. This explanation is consistent with the details found in Scripture. It does not require a strained fitting of three days and three nights between Friday evening and Sunday morning at sunrise by speculating about parts of days and nights. The UCG teaches against government involvement in many areas. On military service, they say, We believe that Christians are forbidden by the commandments of God from taking human life directly or indirectly, and that bearing arms is contrary to this fundamental belief. Therefore, we believe that Christians should not voluntarily become engaged in military service. If they are involuntarily engaged in military service, we believe they should refuse conscientiously to bear arms and to the extent possible refuse to come under military authority. In a study paper on jury duty, the church states, We believe that members should seek to limit their involvement in the governmental machinery or affairs of this world as much as possible. The paper generally recommends and supports members in not participating in jury duty, but allows them freedom of conscience to do so as well. On voting, the UCG's position paper states of the Worldwide Church of God that church literature clearly established the church as being opposed to voting or running for political office. The UCG still encourages this, stating, The United Church of God and International Association maintains its traditional teaching that a Christian should avoid voting and participating in political elections and running for public office. The church does not declare voting itself to be a sin. They also say, Voting in local issue-driven matters has been seen as an exception. Several kinds of situations might come up in this category. Local school bond issues, PTA, water treatment, zoning changes, sewage disposal, trash hauling, wildlife and environmental protection, among other things that directly affect the residents of a township, city, or rural area. These cases of local issues are not viewed in the same manner as participating in the politics of this world. The church also has a doctrinal statement that speaks against swearing oaths that members should simply say yes or no. Of what the church is, the UCG says, We believe that the church is that body of believers who have received and are being led by the Holy Spirit. The true Church of God is a spiritual organism. Its biblical name is the Church of God. UCG Minister Paul Moody, in a sermon called Identifying Characteristics of the True Church on July 2, 2021, said that the United Church of God doesn't say that we are the only Church of God group. God knows who are His, and it's those who are led by His Spirit. However, in the same sermon, Moody identified the true Church of God as only being made up of those who keep the laws, Sabbath, and holy days, and that God's name is connected to their identity excluding Baptists, Pentecostals, and Lutherans, simply because of their name from being the true church. The UCG has a general conference made up of all ordained ministers in good standing and a council of 12 elders selected by the conference. There are also national councils. Doctrinal changes must go through the general conference, which has at the least an annual meeting. Of offices within the local church, the UCG says, each local congregation, where possible, is guided and shepherded by a pastor, assisted by elders, deacons, and deaconesses. On women in ministry, they say, Early church history, the book of Acts, shows that the church continued selecting only men to serve as elders and pastors. 
Therefore, we conclude that a woman's role in the church, although unique and valuable, does not include ordination to this type of ministry or preaching during church services. They do ordain women to an office of deaconess. As of 2022, there were 187 congregations in the United States. They do not own their own buildings, but rather rent space from other churches, community centers, hotels, or similar buildings. Many ministers oversee multiple congregations. Worldwide, there are 339 English-speaking congregations, 33 Spanish, 13 German, 11 French, and 3 Portuguese. The total number of people in the U.S. that the church claims to be associated with them is 11,918. The church publishes Beyond Today magazine, which has 285,000 subscribers. Since 1996, they have printed 11.4 million booklets. The church does extensive advertising online. Their Beyond Today TV YouTube channel has over 67,000 subscribers, and their Bing and Google ads have received 12.6 billion impressions since 2004, with 152 million in 2020. Over 23,000 unique listeners listen to UCG Radio via their app. In the years leading up to the formation of the UCG and in the years following, the Worldwide Church of God changed their doctrine and essentially became a totally different denomination, today known as Grace Communion International. To learn about them and where they ended up, click here.